Then I would appreciate it, and I, I'll only say it once, so you know, I won't let be accused of browbeating anyone as I, as I have been in the past. Uh, look around and see if there's somebody you've never met, and please say hello to them. And those of you that are logged on, wherever you are in the universe, we're glad that you are here. Ernest, how you doing? Samuel, see you. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, uh, I always like to do a little, just a little posting about what I'm, what's going to happen in a in a day. And this morning, I was uh, sincerely, I just wanted to post about the feeling of gratitude that I have. Uh, uh, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've been through a lot of transition and. It's so wonderful. I, I seriously do not take it for granted that uh, I get to do what I love to do uh, for a living. Uh, I would do it free of charge. Uh, thank God I don't have to. <laughs> if you're going, well, he said he'd do it free of charge. We don't have to give. No, I mean, I appreciate when you support what we do so we can keep going. But um, But I really do love it, and I never take for granted that uh, not only of most of you have been with me for a long time. You've been with me through a lot of transition. And some of you drive great distances to be here. That's never lost on me. And I try to make it worth your while. I, I don't, I, you're, you're busy people. So I don't, want, I don't want to just say, ah, you know, let it. No, if you're, if you're going to drive half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour to get here, I want it to be worth your while. And I believe that it is. I believe that uh, what we do here on Sundays is valuable. I, I always think, would I be willing, would I get up and do it? And I think, yeah, I would. I would come here. I would this. I would like this environment. Uh, I need some kind of faith community, whether you call it church or not. I need some group of people, you know, as they said, it, it, it cheers. You want to go where everybody knows your name. And so, uh, so that's, you know, it's good to have people care about you. And if they don't see you for a couple of weeks, somebody's going to call you and make sure you're not in a ditch somewhere and never, you know, <laughs> but, uh, it's good. And, and what we do here is, uh, it's always positive. And as we enter this second year, I, I just think there hasn't been one moment that I haven't enjoyed, uh, at Metron. And so I'm so grateful to all of you are part of it. And those of you that are streaming, and, uh, especially those of you that can't be here that are, are great distances away. Uh, so happy for the technology. Sometimes technology can be obnoxious, but for the most part, it's a, it's a real blessing to keep up with everybody's birthdays. Uh, Pastor Tony had a milestone birthday day, day before yesterday, right? So, <clears throat> I'm going to wish him a happy birthday. Yesterday was my dad's 82nd birthday and their, their 60th anniversary. <clears throat> so, we took them out last night, and then tonight we're going to have a little celebration for the anniversary of my aunt and uncle's house. So. Excited about that, and um, I don't know if she's—I don't know if Chandra's going to be here today. But Chandra, I—I had mentioned Shante Khan, but actually, Chandra is going to be here next month. We're going to have Shante later, but not Shante. Chelsea, she, I've got all these CH names: Chandra, Shante, Chelsea. Uh, but um, today's Chandra's birthday. If you get a chance to give her a little shout out, and um, uh, you know, August is always our big birthday month. Tomorrow is Judah's, so we'll just. By the time Judas comes around the 31st, we're just like, dear God, what else? Here is some money. Just, God. <laughs> Bless his heart. He's always like, sorry, mine's the last one. But uh, anyway, and uh, is anybody else's birthday today or this week that I uh, missed? Uh, well, whenever yours is, happy birthday. Anybody's in September coming up? Yeah? Jackie? Good. Excellent. Um, we're already in agreement. You wouldn't have made the effort to be here if you weren't in agreement. So I don't need to put you through any kind of mental preparation. We're going to have some great music just because it, it opens up our spirit. But it's not, it's not because we're, it's, we're trying to get on the same page. We live on the same page. And uh, today is just a manifestation of that. So it's a good day. We declare the end from the beginning. 
David said, I was glad when they said it to me, let's go into the house of the Lord. Wherever that house is, if it's in a conventional church, or if it's in a theater, or if it's at Starbucks, it's, it's wherever two or more are gathered together with that same energy. There's a, a, a manifestation of the Christ. Uh, we're working on a new uh, intro, but in the meantime, uh, let's play this one. And uh, if you want to chant, uh, I'll say something about Doss. Doss and Ginger are not here today, but uh, she started a little chant last week. So if you want to do it, you, you may. Go ahead and run this. Please remain standing, and then I'll introduce our awesome guest. Good morning, and welcome to Metron. Metron is measure or sphere of influence, and we want to help you find your Metron through motivation, enlightenment, transcendence, renewal, outreach, and network. Today is your day to find your Metron. Good morning, buenos dias, bonjour, we're glad to have you. Those of you that did the backstroke to get here this morning, we truly appreciate all of our Olympic swimmers. Uh, glad to have our first timers. I know uh, Tony and Wayne brought some friends with them today, so we're glad to have all of you. Welcome. Uh, with Corey, is this your first time? What's your name? Ken, we're glad to have you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Anybody else here for the first time? All right. First timers? Well, I'm so glad you're here. Um, August has been great, especially because we got an extra uh, week out of it, and um, always happy to have Marshall Ruffin. Uh, and with Marshall, with Marshall comes the lovely Corey, who's a very talented artist, and and um, uh, they got apparently got all their moving done this week, so they're all moved in, mission accomplished. So that's good, and. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to tell you that he's one of my favorite singers, but not not just because of his talent. I I really love his soul. I love I love what's on the inside. Um, I've heard good singers before that kind of didn't have something on the inside, and I don't know whether you call it anointing or gifting or whatever. It's I, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. And the first note out of his mouth. Back in March, I said, oh, yeah, there's that. And uh, so they will um, always be a part of us, whether he's here uh, every month or not. Um, I know that you enjoy him as well. So um, I'll let him tell you if, you if he wants you to sit or stand. But you please welcome uh, the awesome Marshall Ruffin. Marshall! Yeah. That is my mom's birthday. Oh, 
dia
my living in vain? Is my giving in vain? Is my praying in vain? Is my fasting in vain?
That was the Clark sisters. If you haven't seen, man, if you haven't seen the YouTube clip of them at the Apollo doing that young gospel showcase in like 1970 something, they're all in those pink chiffon dresses. I don't know. That's one of their big. They do a thing where they say when those. Oh, that might be the last one. They do the, yeah, they do a shout good. song, and it's just like know, the whole time it's just hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And then, okay, so it ends. The band just stops playing, and uh, Twinkie, the organist, she just stands up, walks over to the edge of the stage, and nothing's going on. There's no music. It's just everybody's clapping. It's like Rocky. It's so... <laughs>
when compared to the man. With a satisfied Marshall Ruffin. Amazing. 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 Marshall, that was amazing. Tony, I think you got a surprise. Welcome, Lady E. Glad to have you. I think she came in for Tony's birthday. That's awesome. Y'all can squeeze on down. We got, ex come right here. Beautiful. Uh, you may be seated. Uh, did you just fly in from Boston? Gig, gig. Glad to have you. Um, I want to say a couple of things about uh, the music. First of all, I love that cover of Here Comes the Sun. And you don't mess with my Beatles because I love music. I mean, I've been to Liverpool, I've toured their homes. I'm, I've been on Penny Lane, you know what I mean? Uh, but that was really cool. That's a, uh, I, don't, I don't like to get up in his spiritual grill that much, but that was prophetic. Here comes the sun. Then, I won't say who, but I noticed some people walked in as he was singing, It's Not in Vain. You heard me. You know who you are. I got some people who are here today that have been... Tempted to be weary and well-doing, trying to start a business. Um, all I can tell you is this. We've all been there. Uh, I just did a battery of interviews for the 10th reality show. And I've just decided not to have a, a, an attitude about it. I'm like, hey, do you want to talk to me? Clearly, the universe is trying to tell my story. There's a part of me that wants to say this is a waste of my time. But, you know, when you're dealing with... NBC Universal or the History Channel or some of, I mean, these are like the biggest producers there are. They keep wanting to talk to me. 
it can be discouraging when you've put some time in. Uh, but I want to encourage everybody, be not weary in well-doing, you shall reap in due season if you faint not. Um, it's not in vain. How many, how many of you believe that was a rhema word for you today? Because you know it, I've thought of it my own self. You know what I mean? There's some days where you're like, is it, am I making any difference at all? And, then, and that's, uh, that's an important um, message. You know, there's a time when you need to know to move on from something, but uh, for the most part, it's not that time yet. And um, I remember hearing a story about a man that drilled for oil in Texas because he heard there was oil and he bought thousands of acres and they drilled and they drilled and they drilled and they drilled and they just kept hitting dust. And one day he came into his wife. He said, you know what? I'm a fool. Uh, I should have never bought this property. It's a pipe dream. Nothing's going to happen here. Let's try Let's just move this property as quick as we can and, you know, just cut our losses. So they sold the property for virtually no profit. The person that bought the property came in that afternoon and said, where was the last well you were digging? They showed him where it was. He punched down 10 inches below the surface and hit enough oil to pay off the property that day. Now, that may not be true for everybody. There is a time where I, I know what it's like to know a season has ended. And Ecclesiastes 3 is true to everything there is a season. But the prophetic word, here comes the sun. And Michelle, that was a nice touch with the sunflower. I got it. It was cool. You better go. With you. you better go. And um, that's a prophetic word. It's not as, vain, not as vain as a prophetic word. Satisfied mind, that's just my theme song. I'm, you're welcome that you got to listen to it. But that was totally, that's totally for me. Uh, so that's my song, because I'm telling you, having a satisfied mind is uh, is important. So um, please turn and look at the lovely lady uh, there, right there behind Sharon. And if you would repeat after me, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Chandra. Happy birthday to you. And we'll... I know they're going to be, we're going to be singing to Tony later today, so I'll save that. Uh, he had a milestone. He turned 25 this week. So that was good. And uh, of course, Tony, you look entirely different than you looked on your birthday last year. So it's kind of like, it is kind of a, a new start for you. So... Um, Listen, 50 is good. 50, I, I love to turn to 50. 50 with, 40 messed with my head. 40 got in my, I remember I went for a checkup like a couple of weeks later and the, and the, the nurse said, how old are you? And I couldn't say it. I said, I'm, 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 I had to write it. I'm this many. But 50, I was like, I'm 50, what? You know, it's like I, uh, 50 is, and I hear 60. I'm looking forward to the, the big 6 -0. So 60's the bomb. We're, we're, we're recreating all of it. Uh, and I also want to say congratulations to Larry on your uh, nomination. Uh, can we, um, we have a few days to vote on that, right? It's, you're nominated for radio personality, is that what it is? For the Gospel Choice Awards, you can, what, go to your Facebook page to, okay. Go to the website and vote for Larry because uh, uh, Sean and Larry, are, what I love about they're they're both talented and I love the way they support each other. The other night, so those of you went to hear, and, and also Agape, uh, you know, they're they're backing her up. And they're, I, I watch them watch her and it's like they've never heard her sing before. They're like, oh my God, she's really good. But then when Larry's doing his thing, Sean is just as supportive. That's very, very cool to see a creative family like that. I uh, love when Agape's wailing on that trumpet. and um, So anyway, please vote for Larry because uh, we want you all to do well. And uh, Lana, glad you're here. Uh, just glad everybody's here. Uh, Margus, are you coming in with those 
Michelle Obama arms coming in today. Mm -hmm. I saw you coming in, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, glad Alicia's here with her Las Vegas hair. I love it. You, uh, hey, sweetie, I see you back there in the back. Always glad to have you. We need to have you come do my Artist of the Month. You can sing, uh, what was, uh, oh, Proud Mary. <laughs> what was that for the, it was for the retirement home where you were like on a, you know how the I Continue Turn Review starts really slow with left a good job. And she came out with like a, like a house coat on and a walker. So she's like walking out, left a good job in the city. And then, you know, Tina doesn't do anything nice and easy. She does everything nice and rough. And when they started the do, 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 she rips it off and she's suddenly Tina Turner of the retirement home. I was like, well, I didn't see that coming, but uh, you better go on with your bad self. I've never looked at you the same way after that. But um, I'm glad you're all here. Uh, keep uh, keep Richard's family in your prayer. He's got some issues going on with, with both his parents. And uh, it was interesting that I was watching on uh, public TV last night a documentary about um, Hubert Humphrey. And your uncle was all in there. I, I, I told Ken, I said, "What? look how much he looks. I see the family resemblance. And, you know, it was a different time. I mean, he's... All those guys evolved as they got older, and, uh, but um, keep uh, Richard in your prayers and his dad especially. Uh, man, I'm just enjoying visiting with you. Always uh, glad to have Dr. Ralph Martin with us, and uh, I always had to bring my A game when when you ask Ralph Martin like just say good morning. He, you know, everything that comes out of his mouth is like you feel like you should be sitting on top of a mountain in Tibet. <laughs> and he should be calling you grasshopper. <laughs> but uh, it's true. You know it's true. Of course, we've had to, uh, you know, they took us to Maggiano's, and I gained six pounds in one night. That's why, that's why I had to go back on Isogenics. And uh, then last week, she came, Francis comes bringing in this gourmet popcorn. It's got three different kinds. It's like this big huge tub of it and I swear it's laced with crack cocaine because you cannot you cannot eat a handful you can't do it you'll hurt somebody you'll be like get out of my way I'm getting some more popcorn I got a monkey on my back anyway <laughs> um Roz uh email text me this morning asking about the if they're going to do uh feeding the homeless today that's your call. I don't know if when it rains, I know a lot of times those guys go to a shelter. So um, one way or the other, uh, if you can't do it today, we'll, you know, we'll, it, it doesn't all have to be done this month. Um, next month, we're going to be um, our outreach of month is going to be the American Cancer Society. And um, I want to do that for several reasons. I, I just I, I like to make every proactive move we can. I hate cancer, and I know a lot of you uh, have dealt with it, are dealing with it in your families and your loved ones, and of course, uh, keep Sandra in your uh, thoughts and prayers, And um, but at least every little bit that we can do, to me, is a, is a move in a positive direction, and one that's one of the reasons why I had mentioned going to the Carter Center for our outreach, but that's one reason I'd, I'd like to go ahead and, and do that this month. Um, because of he's recently been in the news because of his own cancer. So we're going to be going to the Jimmy Carter Center on Saturday, September 26th. And uh, we'll just meet over there, and then we're going to go to Mary Max and have some turnip greens and cream corn. And Because uh, you ain't from Atlanta if you had not eaten at Mary Max. It's not soul food, it's comfort food. Soul food's a different thing, but comfort food's good too. So you'll uh, you'll enjoy. If you want soul food, you got to go. I'll take you some other places in town. You got to go for that. Colonnade's not quite soul food. Colonnade's old people and gay people, but <laughs> but they do have good vegetables. And Colonnade has some vegetables that Mary Max doesn't have, 
we ate there last week because so so you got to know fat mats bar we ate at fat mats this week it was ooh, if you've never been to fat mats barbecue it's a hole in the wall but they've got really good um they have like live music in there and it's cheap and it's just it's just great yeah, I know where all the places are. Y'all got to stick with me. I'll, I'll take you places. I also want to say, before I get into my word very quickly, I, 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 um, they're not here today, but uh, I did go out to Covington and perform a wedding ceremony this week for Doss and Ginger. They've been together 40, Gigi, they've been together 41 years, and it was, it was actually their 41st anniversary on the 26th. And it was, it was really cool. Let, let me just say... Um, you know, it's a big deal to see them get married in Newton County, and um, they never imagined 41 years ago that it would even be possible for them to be legally married. And you meet those two women who have, who met in high school and tell me they're not a legitimate married, not a gay married couple, a married couple. And let me just say this, because uh, I, I need to say a little something about it. Um, I, I noticed there's a seems to be a move among a lot of um, judges who are stepping down from their places of uh, of service because they refuse to marry same-sex couples and i've and i've seen i don't know why these people are friends with me on facebook but i've seen several people post pictures of sort of you know sour looking <laughs> people standing there with a plaque you know they're making their statement because they they had to step down because it conflicts with their biblical interpretation my issue with that is fine if you're gonna if you're gonna step down from your job then you need to you need to play the entire bible card and if you really are going for biblical marriage you need to not marry straight couples that have been divorced and remarried because the scripture says much more about that than it does but jesus actually did talk about divorce and remarriage he never mentioned same sex um you need to make sure that you own if you're if there's a woman involved you make sure she's a virgin because according to moses law uh, all women have to pass a very embarrassing and intrusive uh, virginity test that that was basically tantamount to a um, gynecological visit, and and that if she didn't pass it in in front of the elders of the city, if that doesn't, I mean, I love Moses, but if that doesn't creep you out, not the mothers of the city. Oh, oh, did I get to y'all? Y'all y'all never read the Old Testament that if she didn't pass the virginity test, she was to be stoned with stones. So if you're going to step down, then you need to make sure you're throwing some rocks at a bunch of girls that I know are not virgins. And thirdly, if you really want to go back to biblical marriage, uh, you need to be aware that under biblical law, when a man just got tired of his wife, he didn't even have to give her a reason. All he had to do was write her a writ of divorcement and not only did she have to be out that day, he absorbed all of her wealth because uh, women at that time had um, uh, dowries. And when you married a woman, you took her dowry. That's where the word betrothal comes from, your troth. Uh, if you're betrothed to someone, it means what's mine is yours now. And not only, the you know, Bible didn't support child support and alimony so if a if a man just got now a woman couldn't divorce her husband and he could and he could have a bunch of wives solomon had 703 concubines but if he got tired of any of the wives he could dismiss them the same way that uh abraham dismissed hagar and even though they weren't married you know hagar was just there was no provision for her it was just like you're just out of luck baby you know and, and she had ishmael and uh all she had was a prophecy he said you know Great nations are going to come out of you, but when your baby's crying, that, that, that prophecy doesn't really help that much. But um, I looked at this one, you know, I could, I could tell from her her attire, she was old school Pentecostal, and she had her, you know, she had her plaque that she was given. And I thought, all right, that's fine, lady, but if you're going to, if you really support biblical marriage, you might better go back and read what the Bible actually says, because you probably don't want that. Uh, your husband might want biblical marriage because that means he has as many wives as he wants. Or if you don't want to marry him, you can just call him a concubine and still enjoy the services. Oh, y'all are looking at me like, you're just making up stuff that's in the B-I-B-L-E. I grew up singing, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone in the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. 
when I see some church says, we believe the whole Bible, I'm like, really? Like if your eye offends you, you're going to gouge it out? Really? Are you? Because I noticed nobody in your church is missing an eye. So I'm assuming nobody's missing a hand. And Jesus said, cut it off if it offends you. So either y'all are perfect or you don't really practice the whole Bible. You practice the verses that prop up your agenda that you want to bully some people with. But if you're going to practice the whole Bible, then you're an abomination, I'm an abomination, all God's people are an abomination. Thank you for coming. God bless you. That being said, congratulations to us and Gigi. Um, <laughs> and you know what? It really was sweet. They, I don't know who they were lip syncing to. Who's, whose song was that? Anyway, they, they walked in and sang to each other, and it was really, Doss is a hoot. If you don't know who Doss is, oh, oh, that's all. <laughs> Any of the, the noises that you hear from this area. It's not coming from Romanita. It's coming from Doss. All right. Uh, this morning I posted that I'm, I'm happy we had a fifth Sunday this month because I really want to mine a lot of treasure out of this. And I don't feel obligated to always use nothing but Scripture. But again, today I just have three Scriptures that I want to show you. Um, <laughs> that may sound like a contradiction after everything I just said. No, I love the Bible. I just believe it needs to be rightly divided. And you have to understand the context and the the Bible writers would fully agree with me on that and would be shocked and offended that people have exalted some of their ideas about God to the Word of God. When people say, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? I have to say, well, the Bible writers didn't believe it was the Word of God, not all of it. You know, even Paul would write some things and he says, this came by the commandment of the Lord and this other thing is just my opinion. It's amazing that people don't know how to just read it in context. You don't even have to understand Hebrew and Greek to read that. But because we're talking about challenging your preconceptions, I want to show you these three quick passages and then I'll let you get out of here. Um, I do want to talk about, however, the word preconception. If you'll notice, the, the word concept is in there and it comes from the same word, you know, when you conceive something. Like when a, when a woman becomes pregnant, she conceives something there's a seed planted uh, and it begins to cultivate and that every one of you technically are a concept that was manifested. There was conception. Um, a misconception is when you have a, a wrong perception of something. And in, in my opinion, a, mis a misperception is not as binding as a preconception. A misconception can come from when you just haven't seen a thing correctly. A preconception is when you're not even open to even having it challenged how you see a thing. You've already made up your mind uh, before. And, and not all preconceptions are, are negative. There are some things... Uh, it doesn't matter how things appear on the surface. Because I've already, I have a preconception that I'm going to be okay one way or the other. But for the most part, our preconceptions challenge us. And as uh, we talked about last week from Star Trek, what was the character that said it, Charles? I don't remember. It was for, it, yeah, that guy. Uh, he said, challenge your, the Vulcan proverb was, challenge your preconceptions or your preconceptions will challenge you. And that is absolutely the truth. Um, I was thinking about it this morning. I, I've taught on Genesis 1 so many times, but I was kind of even thinking about it in a different light today, how that, because um, I don't necessarily believe all of that is literal. We know that the earth is millions, possibly billions of years old, but Moses had a, an idea of uh, the way he explained creation that was very poetic, was never meant to be taken literally. And Moses would be the first one to tell you, I was speaking poetically about that, but you know, the first part of creation is let there be light. And then he begins to, he creates like what the scripture later calls line upon line, precept upon precept. Like there's this, there's, there's water, then there's this, then there's a separation of the firmament, then there's this kind of animal and this kind of animal. Finally, on the sixth day, it's man. And I think that's an interesting idea about conception, how a concept um, evolves. Every part of the reality of your life is a manifestation of how you have conceptualized your life. Your life is what you believe it is. 
um, I, I watched some of the talk online this week. People, some people were saying, how could a, a man like Jimmy Carter, whether you agree with his politics or not, you can't deny the fact that he has spent all these years since leaving office, not just Habitat for Humanity, but I'm talking about going to very obscure places in Africa and, and helping people with overcome guinea worms and all this kind of stuff that a man like him wouldn't even have to do. Um, I, I would call him nearly like a modern day saint. And that's, that's an apolitical statement. He's just a, a godly, uh, very progressive man. And I, I saw several people say, how can a man like Jimmy Carter get cancer? You know, why would God, why would God give Jimmy Carter cancer? Why would let, why would God let Jimmy Carter have cancer? And I remember reading something that an atheist wrote about 9-11, and she said, she says, you know, one perk that atheists have is when, um, when a thing like 9-11 happens, we don't have anybody to blame. We're just like, well, stuff happens. And I thought, that, that's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, this week was the 10th anniversary of Katrina, and I remember lots of preachers uh, were saying that Katrina was the wrath of God and, on um, New Orleans, and you know what's silly about it is, uh, as I've told you before, I was at, I was in New Orleans just weeks after Hurricane Katrina, and um, Bourbon Street was fine. I mean, I was there passing out tracks and <laughs> leading people to Jesus because somebody needed to do it. But um, but <laughs> yeah. I thought, you know, if God's really trying to wipe out a wicked city, His aim is terrible, you know, because all He did was get those you know people in trailer parks on the outskirts of the city, but the, I'm telling you, the strip clubs and the gay bars and the, you know, the, they were all just doing, a couple of them missing, missing shingles, but I promise you, they were all functioning, or so I heard. And uh, actually, I was there with the, the Global Peace Festival, and so I mean, it was a very well-behaved trip. Now I've been back subsequently, and it was a different story, it's none of your business. Um, but the point is, you know, a lot of people uh, believe that. And, and, and um, you know, the, the upside to believing in a higher power is when something good happens, you can give your concept of God praise. The downside to it is when things don't work out the way you would like to, you want to question that deity, which is enter the devil. That's why a lot of people use the devil to blame for all the bad stuff. You know, we serve a good God and a bad devil. I'm not here to split hairs with that theology. What I am saying is, um, I am to a place now, and it, even to swear to my own hurt, I love the idea of taking full responsibility for my own life. Now, I do believe it's an act of creativity, that the ultimate act of creation is that the creator created creators. So I believe the fact that I'm able to create the life that I want is an act of God. I do believe it is the divine spark. I do believe in a higher power. I do believe intelligent in intelligent design. But I don't believe that God just has this plan that's going to be working whether I want it to or not. That to me is a cop-out, and I see too many people wasting too many years of their life thinking that, well, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. No, God's empowered you to do it. Go back and read the original purpose is let us make people in our image and let them have dominion. Let's, in other words, let's create an environment uh, for them to thrive in and let's see what they create with it. No matter what you think about people like, um, who's the guy, the Apple guy? Steve Jobs. You can't tell me that that's not a divine spark in a man like him to have that kind of creativity. You say, well, he died of cancer. Look, I don't have all the answers to why things work out in people's lives the way they do. What I am telling you, and I'm telling me, and I'm reminding me, we are creating our life every day by the way we are conceptualizing our life. And really, your life is created one day at a time. You create your day. Uh, you know, this morning even, just something as simple as I was getting ready and, the, you know, it's, it's gray and rainy. And my first thought is, oh, man, seriously, rain, really? And then I thought, you know, get it in perspective. It's rain. It happens. 
it's the end of summer. It's like it's a part like you might want to get this some some perspective. And I'm pretty sure my car can function in the rain. So you might want to you might want to get is it obnoxious a little? Are you gonna have to be a little careful driving? Yeah, I heard I twenty was a little bit of a challenge this morning. All right, that's what that's just called a fact of life. That ain't spiritual warfare. And you don't need to be dragging God and the devil into it. It's just it's just rain and it happens, and you might want to get a grip. That being said, I do believe the same creative divine energy that said, let there be light is saying, let there be a Monday, let there be a Tuesday, let there be this, let there be prosperity, let there be health, let there be, you know, even I want to respect my parents, but even last night, and my mom may be streaming and I, I would say it if they were here, I said, mom, I'm, I'm aware that y'all are 82 and 77, but I'm just asking you kindly to stop prefacing statements with when you get to be our age i said i know you don't realize how much you're saying that but you're just saying it you're i think you're hurting yourself with it when you keep saying well when you get to be i said i'm fully aware that there are some changes our bodies go through as we as we get older i'm not i'm not denying that i just want y'all to realize how young you look because people don't believe it when the when the waitress came last night i said tonight is my dad's 82nd birthday and she laughed i said no i'm serious today's their 60th anniversary and she's like there's no way they've been married 60 years i said yeah i mean it's good lighting in here it's you know, it's a little dark but you know when i say 82 and 77 that you don't quite visualize my parents so i, I said you know you guys need, don't be cursing yourself with when you get to be our age because every time you say it you age about six months. I mean, you do. <laughs> so, the only way you can reverse it is, you know, just you, you have to create a different concept. Um, the other day I posted some picture, a profile picture, and one of my Facebook friends said, uh, they said, the caption was redefining what a grandfather looks like one picture at a time. I said, you are currently my favorite Facebook friend. I love that. That's awesome. Every picture of me now, I'm like redefining what a grandfather looks like one picture at a time. <laughs> and I know that sounds silly, but you have to, you have to conceptualize your life. Uh, every this theater is here because somebody had a concept. They said, "Let's let's build a theater and let's we'll have eight different houses in it and and it'll look like this and it'll be in midtown." I mean, every every everything is a manifestation of a concept, and that is true for your life. First scripture I want to show you. This is out of First Samuel, and this story always reminds me of the Cinderella story. You know, at the end when Prince Charming is trying to find the um, the glass the fit for the glass slipper and the two stepsisters try it and, and he says there's somebody else and they finally bring cinderella out. well this is the story of samuel going to anoint the next king of israel so he goes to god tells him it's it's, it's he's one of jesse's sons so they go you know the 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 conventional wisdom was it's the eldest son who will be the heir apparent that's still true today even in monarchy uh, I think England just recently changed it to uh, where uh, it's not so patriarchal. But um, but I love this because it's, I, I won't read you the whole chapter, but basically Jesse parades all of his sons in front of Samuel, like the ugly sisters with Prince Charming. What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? And everyone, he's like, you got anybody else? And they finally said, well, we got one more, but he's like a shepherd boy up on the hill. I mean, you could it couldn't possibly be him. And let me show you. Here's the verse. This is in the Amplified Bibles, verse 7. He says, but the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his appearance or at the height of his stature, for I have rejected him. Now, what he's saying there is, I know to your preconception, this is what a king is supposed to look like. 
but I, that's, I have a different idea. For whatever you think about our current president, the fact is, the fact that we have had a man of color in the White House now has changed the preconception. If we have a woman in the White House, again, preconception will be changed. Presidents don't always have to be white males. And until Obama was elected, that was the reality. Now, that's not the reality. Whether you like it or not, that's, that's not the reality anymore. And so people have this idea, this is what a president looks like. Well, not anymore. He goes on to say, For the Lord sees not as man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Um, I have a friend who was, he probably doesn't want me to say his name. He's, he's, he's kind of evolved in a very different direction, but he was a rock star at one time and was on Broadway uh, in a rock musical. And he told me that one day, he was making so much money at the time that he, he walked in with a paper sack full of cash to buy, um, it's, I don't think it was a Lamborghini, but it was something, it was some crazy expensive car. And this is back in the 70s, and he's got long hair and jeans and looks like a hippie, and because uh, he was a hippie and was somewhat of a drug addict, but he had a lot of money in that bag. So he came into the dealership and said, I'd like to test drive the car, and the, the dealer said, he kicked him out. He said, uh, we can't let somebody like you even sit in this car so he went to the manager and he said uh i'm prepared to pay cash for a car but your uh guy won't even let me test drive the car because of what i look like and he showed the man the cash and the man said excuse me a minute went and fired the guy and he said if you'll come with me and test drive it we can work out something and he worked out a, de a deal and a few minutes later he paid cash for that car and drove it off the lot. But it was a, a valuable lesson to someone to say, just because somebody looks like they have money doesn't mean they have money. And even if they have money, doesn't mean they're going to spend money. Back in my shopping days, I don't shop like I used to because I got enough. But back in my shopping days, there were certain stores I would always buy my clothes in. And the people that waited on me knew when I came in, I bought something. I'm not a shopper. I'm a buyer. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I don't enjoy browsing. I have a thing in my head. I need a new Navy suit. I know what brand I like. I walk in. Where's the guy? You know, whatever. So even now, all these years later, when I, I don't shop like I used to, but I can walk in some of those places. Those guys still work there. I can't believe the service that I get because they know Mr. Swiley's a sure thing. I told you, I've told you the story a million times, but I don't even know if FUBU is still doing this, but they, for a little while they were making business suits and I actually liked them. They, were, they, weren't, they weren't too conservative. They weren't too flashy. They were just kind of somewhere in the middle there. And uh, so I picked out a couple of them. I was at Macy's or somewhere, and, and, but I asked the guy, African-American guy that was waiting on me, I said, is it okay that I buy these suits? He said, why wouldn't it be? I said, well, for us, by us. I mean, I don't know. Can I buy this suit? And he said, brother, you buy this suit, you're us. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but um, the, the, the point is, just because somebody has it doesn't mean they're going to give it. Uh, even... Um, the opening Sunday when we first built uh, the Church of the Now, which is now Springfield, uh, I had Dr. Mark Rutland came and spoke the dedication. He was the president of my alma mater. And he was telling me that day that when I, when I went to Southeastern, there was a mobile home park that used to be next door to the campus. And it was very run down, very stereotypical mobile home park. And he said, one day this... A uh, little couple that lived in the mobile home park next door came to see him. And they said, we'd like to see Dr. Rutland. And he said, my secretary nearly sent them away to, you know, let, let me show you where our, our clothes closet and food uh, places. Because that's what they, 
by their appearance, that's what they thought they had come for, food pantry. And the woman said, no, we want to write a check to the school. And so she called Dr. Rutland, and she said, they, they want to write a check. So he said, I very magnanimously went out because I'm going to take their, you know, what, their little $10 check. So she takes the checkbook out, and she writes one, comma, zero, 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 comma, zero, zero, zero. Wrote a check for one million dollars. And he said, I, I just thought, you know, the scripture says comfort the, comfort the feeble-minded. So I'm looking at these people thinking, there's no possible way you have a million dollars. But thank you. So he said, thank you very much. God bless you. And somebody in the staff said, should we even deposit it? Guess what? It was good. Now when you, of course, when Southeastern expanded, they took out the mobile home park. So I guess those people, uh, I'm surely with their kind of money, they went wherever they wanted to go. But the fact is, he said, in, in my life of all these fundraisers and trying to get these big Assembly of God churches to, to give, to squeeze out some money. And then this little couple that lives in a trailer next door comes in and, right, and just right. I don't mean they go get a counter check. I mean, they just write $1 million, there you are, and don't even miss it. So, man looks on the outward appearance. I don't want to make this just about money, but there's a reason why Hebrew says entertain, I mean, uh, be nice to strangers, because some have entertained angels unawares. We've got a little guy, we haven't talked to him yet, but from his appearance, he looks Ethiopian to me, because I've minister to a lot of Ethiopians on the street. And I don't know why, but he's outside our building nearly every day, and he stands in the same spot. And we're always curious why he's standing in the same spot. And we see him around town. We saw him last night. I said, there's, I don't even know we have a name for it. But we're very curious. The other day I was going to take some food out to him, but we went, he was already eating food. But he's starting to get inside my head because he's always, he looks kind of, unusual he has long braids and he's just always standing in a very odd place i'm starting to think is this my ethiopian angel let's go let's go get him a cheeseburger <laughs> and not just because he might be a blessing i'm saying you never know that's why you should always be nice to people because you never know i have gone some places where i got really bad service and i don't ever make a a, a, an issue or whatever but it's that kind of thing where you're like you have no idea what a good customer you just lost because i'm not only a good customer i'm also influential i tell people if i say oh y'all should go try that restaurant i promise you there's gonna be some people this week that are gonna go try that restaurant because they you know they listen to my word i have people that won't even go see a movie until i write a review of it because they're like i like you know you tell me if i like it or not before i go spend my money so there's some people that have, you know, kind of treated me badly, and I'm like, oh, man, you so blew it. And then I drive back a couple of months later in their business, out of business, and I'm like, you know, I tried to tell you to bless me. He blesses the, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to, when, when will they ever learn? Um, not just about people, but there are all kind of opportunities. This isn't just about Samuel saying uh, this isn't the brother that you think it's going to be. But um, there are all kind of blessings that come sort of what you think is in disguise. It's not really disguise. It's they don't meet up with your preconception. David did not look like what even his own family thought a king should look like. You know, when Jesse had so many sons, he's not, he's honestly not even thinking about David. David's like, David was nearly an afterthought with them. Like he wasn't, he, he, he wasn't even like part of the, you know, the family community. He was, he, you know, he was odd. He was, he was uh, not only a shepherd, but he was, he was a musician and he was a poet and he was, he walked to another drummer. I'm, you know, I'm sure David's the one that the other brother was like, what's the deal with him? You know, probably thought he was gay or something until they, until David started getting a little action and like, no, he, David definitely likes the ladies. I did a little thing with Jonathan, but I don't think he was actually gay. Jonathan was gay. David wasn't. But that's another, 
That's another teaching. I love when I say some of that and you're like, uh, is it really? I will, I will show you the scriptures. You'll be, you'll be surprised. <laughs> anyway, people say, there's already even gay people in the Bible. You really haven't read it much, have you? They're all up in it. Anyway, <laughs> the second thing I want to show you, this is uh, Isaiah's beautiful I Isaiah prophecy, Messianic prophecy about Jesus. This is how the New King James Version uh, it says, therefore, this is actually verses 1, 2, and 3. Uh, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Have you ever noticed the staff of uh, especially the 12 that Jesus chose. I think, Jesus, you need to go to some kind of business training thing because you clearly do not know how to put a staff together. I mean, he chooses fishermen. He chooses relatives. He chooses a tax collector that the people hate. And here he's trying to endear himself to his audience. And, and people hate this guy. He chooses a guy that's a terrorist, Simon the Zealot or the Canaanite. Um, he chooses one that he knows. He said, I chose you and one of you is a devil. He even knew that one of them was going to betray him and still chose him. You know, if you were going to counsel Jesus about business, you know, Jesus, you need to probably hire a headhunter. But it says here, he, when he comes, he won't judge by his eyes or his ears. Why do you think Jesus hung out with all the wrong people? Because he didn't, the stuff that other people cared about, he didn't care about. I love, my, my favorite passage, I think, out of Matthew is the prophecy about Jesus, and it says, a, a bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoking flax he shall not quench. And what that means is, um, people, would, they used to take, uh, you know, these aquatic um thick stalked plants like uh, bulrushes or cattails, they would take them and cut them and put holes in them and make like a recorder out of them or a flute. And it's just something that people did. It was like whittling. And so when they would make a reed, once it got bruised or once it was damaged, you just threw it away because it's cheap. It's something that you made with your hands. Just go make another one. And the fact that it says Jesus would not... Um, he would not break a bruised reed. He won't crush it. Man, sometimes in the last five years that that scripture saved my life because people who were bound by religious thinking not only saw me as a bruised reed, they saw me, you know, they spoke of me in past tense. Oh, you used to be so anointed. We listen to Wash by the Word and just cry because you used to be, you were so anointed. And they, they had that idea that, well, you're not anymore. You couldn't be now. And then it goes on to say, a smoking flax he will not quench. And what a flax was like a, a wick that floated in um, like a, a oil burning lamp. And once it was saturated and it began to smoke, then you had to get rid of it. And it says, he'll not break. When everybody else has given up on you, the one who does not judge by what things look like says, oh yeah, there's still, there's still potential in that. You can still use that. Amen? There's, a, there's an ad they're running lately for one of the paint companies. And it shows a man buying an old bicycle at a um, flea market. And he says to the guy, how much you, how much? And he says, $2. He says, I'll take it. So he takes it and it shows him spray painting the bike. And he brings back this beautiful, shiny red bike. And, and the guy says, how much would you take for it? He said, $200. And he says, I'll take it. And it, it shows him taking what everybody else has given up on and refurbishing it. And now it becomes somebody else. You know, the old saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And um, 
the good news is, is God always sees you as the treasure. But here's where the transformation comes. Until you see you as the treasure, it doesn't matter what God says. God sees the value. You've said, what's this antique show? Some, you know, people will bring something, you know, we found this uh, antique rocha. Uh, I found this in my grandmother's attic, and the guy says, oh, I think this is worth $15,000. And they're like, what? All kind of things are in people's homes that they don't even know are valuable. But again, I can preach till the cows come home that God sees you as valuable. Until you see it, your preconception is, I'm a loser. I'm not going to make it. Uh, you know, God's given up on me. Most times, you've just given up on you. And you interpret it into your theology and you think God's given up on you. From what I read in the Scripture, God never gave up on anybody. Ever. That's why it was so important what I taught you last week about what that Scripture really says in Genesis. My, my spirit will not always strive with man. That's not what he was saying. They will not breathe forever. That's all, that's all he was saying. But I, but I will guarantee they can breathe for 120 years. God never gives us this ultimatum like, if you don't, you know, if you don't move now, I'm giving up on you. That, that's not, in, not from what I see in the Scripture. And then finally, um, this is a great passage. Uh, when somebody says, do you believe in inclusion? I'm kind of even past. I mean, like, inclusion is like, duh. I mean, that's just the gospel. I don't even consider that groundbreaking anymore. But this is probably the, the best theological Pauline uh, passage on it. And this is out of the message. But this is verses 14 through 21 of 2 Corinthians 5. He says, Our firm decision is to work from this focused center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. Amen. All means all. Amen. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life. A resurrection life, a far better life than people ever lived on their own. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. Why? Because, because God accepted everybody. I mean, that's got to be your bottom line on every relationship. Even if you reach a, an impasse with somebody where you can't trust them or you can't work with them anymore, you still can't write them off. You still have to say, look, our paths are going to go in separate directions because maybe we've done irreparable damage to each other. But you are still valuable. I, I can't hate you. I can't trash you. I'm going to have to, I mean, but because God loves you and we're going to spend eternity together. Bishop, I'm not. I'm only going to be with the righteous. Everybody, according to what this says, everybody's declared righteous. They may not act righteous, but they only don't act righteous because they don't know they're righteous and they're still eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and have not had a revelation of the tree of life, but eventually they will. This will, this will help you so much with your kids. When you keep one, oh, my kids are going to be okay. Eventually they will. I mean, really, this will happen with all relationships. Somebody wrote something to me last night on Facebook that I looked at and I thought, I don't believe that's true about me, but I can tell that's what this person thinks because they're speaking out of their own hurt. And I know the nature of people so much that I could, I could argue this point with them, but all they're going to hear is their hurt. So I can just have to say, well... You know, we're doing the best we can. Sorry. And, you know, I wish you only the best. And I thought, eventually, you'll, you'll see how wrong you are. But there's, in the meantime, it's just the way that you see things. And I understand because I've been hurt before. And I know what it's like when it gets blown up out of your, in your mind. And you think everybody's out. I have been there before. You know, David would say things like, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about. You want to go, really, David, 10,000? I mean, I know you got some enemies, but 10,000s of people. That's why 
I don't mind saying a little something about gay rights or whatever. And and Tuesday night I'm speaking at some church. It's this week is that y'all may not know this, but there's actually a black gay pride. There's like gay pride and there's black gay pride. Don't shoot the messenger. I didn't make it up. But I'm speaking in an event for black gay pride, although I am not a black man, at least as far as we can tell from external. But don't go by my looks. Don't go by my looks because In my soul, I am much more than what you see here. Um, I mean, come on. There's no way I would have the following that I've had all these years. If, and I don't have to act like a, any particular way, because there's a lot of white men that preach a certain way because they're, I don't have to do that because I just, I just am. That's why every, everybody likes me. They just don't know they like me yet. Which is why, like I have other, I have other friends online. I have other gay Christian friends that who I see some of the stuff that they write online and they're very defensive. And I understand because I've, I've posted those same kind of things before. But if you'll notice, I don't now. There was a time... I. I came to a point where I thought, you know, if anybody has a problem with me, that's their problem. They're just living in legalism. That's I'm not. I don't need to try to convince any them of anything. Now, when you look at and this isn't fake it till you make it. This is my reality. You go on my page and it's like life is good. I love life. Here's my family. Here's my parents. Here's my kids. People say. You brag a lot about your kids. You haven't seen anything yet. Tomorrow is Judah's birthday. We're going to take more pictures, and we're going to post them and post them and post them and post them. You got a lot of pictures of Ken. Oh, just wait. Week after next, we're going to Key West. We're going to take so many pictures. And when we get back in town, we're driving up to Nashville for a whole other event. Picture, 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 picture. And we're going to be adorable in every one of them. People say, do you ever take a bad picture? No, we don't. Not, not that you'll see. Now, I'm just saying, I look at other people who, you know, say, I got this letter today that called me. And, you know, been there, done that. Now I'm like, yeah, I've heard that before. That's why I told you last week, this girl that wrote me, have you ever read Romans chapter 1? I said, funny, you should ask. Here's a video I did about it. Here's a book I wrote about it. Here's another video I did about it. I've been sending her stuff all week. Now she's blocking me. But the point is, I'm not trying to be a jerk about it. I'm saying, no, no, I'm good and I'm righteous and I'm blessed and God has blessed me and, and I love my life and I'm not, I'm not trying to rub it in your face. I really am not. And, I, and, and, and furthermore, I understand if you can't follow me, that's fine. I understand not everybody's mature enough for this message. Because if you come to, if you come to sit under my teacher, I'm putting it all on you. You, you miss the devil in my teaching. Like, could you just give us a little devil? Could we blame something on the devil? I'm like, no, it's all you. <laughs> I mean, you got to be grown ass people to get, I'm sorry, you got to be adults, my bad, to drive back up here and get another dose of that. Because children can't handle that. It's like Leona told me a few weeks ago. She said, you know, where could we, we could never go back to a traditional church because we're grown-ups. We couldn't, I'm, you know, I appreciate that kindergarten exists, but I can't sit there in a little table and chair and play with Play-Doh. I mean, it's cute, but I'm a grown-up. So I don't, I'm not even, I'm telling you, I ain't even mad at anybody. I'm like, I get it. If you've got to work out your own salvation, work it out. If you're legalistic, I understand it. I was the same way you were years ago. The 1975 version of me would be out in front of this place denouncing the 2015 version of me. So I understand. And it's all good. It keeps, it keeps my, like Carol gave me that t-shirt years ago, haters make me famous. I, 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 once in a while I wear it just because I like it. Haters make me famous. Sometimes when I need a little attention, I stir up a little bit just to get, a little something, something. But for the most part, I'm like, 
I don't really have haters anymore. I just have people that are, they're not fully enlightened yet. And eventually they'll get it. And that's why people say, Bishop, I think you're mad at me. Baby, I'm not mad at you. If, if I said my piece about something, I've already, do you know how many people I've talked to since I talked to you? I, I don't have time. I got too much. I got too many pictures to take and put on Facebook. I don't have time. <laughs> I don't have time to get involved in some war with you online and me have to, you know, defend myself in some message. I, I don't, I just, it's like writing term papers. I don't want to do it. If that's what you think about me, then, I, you know, sorry you see it that way. And if I can do something to fix it, I will. But if I can't, I got, I got my big fabulous life to maintain. So, yeah, and if you want to be cool with me, Awesome, because eventually we will be cool together. Somewhere in eternity, we'll all be cool. That's the city that's set on the hill. Eventually, we will all be cool with each other. And if you're not cool yet, I'll meet you in whatever and wherever heaven is, and you'll be like, what? What are you doing here? I'm like, baby, I tried to tell you. Now, come on over. We're meeting with Saddam Hussein and... Elijah. <laughs> Does that mess with your head? He says, we looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong. Is that Isaiah 53? There was no form to comeliness that we should... I mean, Jesus did not look at all like what their preconception of what the Messiah was supposed to look like. So that even if He worked miracles, they said, but you don't look like what we think you're supposed to look like. As you know, we certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside, and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. That's where in the King James it says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Is created new. The old life is gone. The new life burgeons. Look at it. All this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. If you're righteous with God, you have to be righteous with me. You have to be. Even if you blew it, even if you ticked me off and made me mad or whatever, I, I have no choice but for you to have right standing. Even if, I, even if we never talk to each other again, I have to say, well, you know what? You have right standing with me because I have right standing with God. And righteousness that is vertical always becomes horizontal and if i'm not righteous with you that's on you that's your problem but i'm not going to have we're not in a war because i'm not in a war with you we're not mad at each other because i'm not mad at you well you said so and so i'm sure i've said all kind of stuff i told you this last week i was asking jackie i said what what happened with somebody close to him and he said well their parents were in the hospital and you didn't come to see them. And I thought, well, I don't remember that, but I'm sure if I was in the hospital and I was upset about my parents, I would, if I had a preconception of what a pastor is supposed to do, I would wish they would shut up. So, I mean, I, I'm sorry that they've been mad at me all these years over something that I had no idea about because I thought once I sent care pastors, it was taken care of because that's the only way I could pastor a church of that size at that time. But I also understand why they were upset. So like, Eventually, they'll get it right. I mean, I shook their hand the other day. At, you know, I'll sit down with them by the river of life. I go, we good now? Not yet. All right, see you in 10,000 years. <laughs> but eventually, you got to get it right. He says, God, look, oh, look at this. God put the American Christian square with himself. God put the heterosexual people who pray to sinners. God put the people that speak in tongues. God put the world square with Himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. If everybody could get an understanding of this, you wouldn't have the racial unrest that we have now. You wouldn't have the prison population that we have now. You wouldn't have war in the Middle East. If, if people just understood this concept, I'm right with God, so i got to be right with you. 
And, and me being right with you doesn't mean I have to understand every part of you. When people say, I just don't understand. Why, why are you that way? You don't, you don't have to understand. Any, it's just not necessary. I have, um, what I have, Xfinity TV, and they said, the other day they said, you need a new box, whatever. So I said, okay. So I hit the thing, they sent it to me. And Ken hooked it up, and then he said, you're supposed to send the old box back to them. And I said, well, how do we do that? He said, what's well, already got a thing on there? And I was like, awesome. And the new way is so much better than the old way. It took me a few minutes to get used to it, but now I'm like, oh, this is way better. Whatever they did, way better. Yesterday, on the way to pick up my parents, we, I said, find where the closest UPS is. We walked in. I kid you not, a guy is standing there with a grin on his face with arms outstretched saying, can I help you? I said, what do I do with this? And he said, is this for Comcast? I said, yes. He said, it's easy peasy. I said, easy peasy. Those are my two favorite words. I said, that's all we need. He said, I got it. I said, we get pick up my parents. We go take them out to eat. We go sit outside. It's beautiful weather. We order appetizers. Our table was ready ahead of schedule. We're sitting just feet away from the little jazz trio that's playing. It's just, it's just like a perfect evening. All the food was wonderful. It was just awesome. I told the, the waitress had a good uh, uh, attitude and a get it factor. When, when I came, I said, you're not going to sing happy birthday or do an interpretive dance? So she did an interpretive dance for my dad. And she got it, and she was funny, so I tipped her extra. And you'd have to see this girl to know it was comical. Please don't get in your mind. This is with some hoochie. No, 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 no. <laughs> Believe me. But the point is, um, I don't understand how that TV works. I don't understand. There's so many things I enjoyed yesterday that I don't fully understand. When I want to watch something, I don't have to say, I need to understand this for me to enjoy it. No, there's some things about you I will never understand. One time I was doing a crossword puzzle at my dad's house, and my dad said, I can't imagine how you do this. I could never pin my brain down to do a crossword puzzle. I said, really? I could never get up before dawn and climb up in a deer stand and stand there for hours waiting for Bambi to walk by and shoot him. But somehow <laughs> I say namaste if that's what you're into. And he said, well, fair enough. I said, there's some things about each other. We're never going to understand. But I was glad he lived to see 82 and we could celebrate him last night. I don't need to understand. He's, there's something, you, I don't like guns. I wish all guns, I'm, don't even get me started on guns. I don't, I don't like to touch them. My dad, there's no, there's no cabinet or drawer you can open that guns don't fall out. <laughs> guns are his favorite thing. They're under the bed. They're behind the door. They're in the cabinet. I don't understand it. He doesn't understand that when he used to take me out shooting, I was like, okay, right. I said, you know guns kill people, right? You do understand. I'm lecturing my dad on the horrors of war. He said, just shoot the gun. <laughs> God put the whole world square with him through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what He is doing. That's where in King James it says God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ Himself now. And look at this. People say, what, what do you have Metron for? I'm not trying to keep people from going to hell. I want people to start loving each other. Amen. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you.
Peter says, I'll never deny you. And Jesus says, yeah, you will. Before the rooster crows, you're going to. But let not your heart be troubled. There's still a room in the house for you. Can you imagine if we were that way with everybody? Say, I don't approve of what you're doing. I don't even like what you're doing. But I still love you. And there's a room for you in my heart. That's why some people say, well, how can you be friends with that guy? Because you disagree with him theologically. Because I don't think that way. I, I am flowing with all kinds of people that I don't agree with about a lot of stuff. It's not a deal breaker for me unless they get ugly about it. If you get ugly and start stressing me out, I'm going to block you. But even then, I ain't going to talk bad about you. I know I'm trying to shut up, but you know, when remember Jesus goes to visit John the Baptist before, right before he's beheaded? And John the Baptist says this insulting thing. He says, are you really the Christ or should we wait for another? And Jesus not only lets it slide, he defends John the Baptist. Remember, he says, what did y'all come out to see? A reed shaken in the wind. He says, I'm here to tell you there was no man who was born of women that had a higher calling than John the Baptist. And this is a man that's just completely denounced him. Why could Jesus do that? Because he didn't judge by the sight. He didn't judge by preconceptions. He saw the big picture. He saw the finished product. He who began a good work in you will continue to perform it to the day of the Lord. We are God's workmanship, creating the good works that God has before ordained that we walk in them. He has declared the end from the beginning. The God who quickens the dead and calls those things which are not as though they are. You can't give up on yourself because God can't give up on you. You can't give up on your dream because if you give up on your dream, you've given up on yourself. Bishop, you don't know how hurt I am. Welcome to the world, baby. The world hurts. I remember being five or six and I fell off my trike or something. I was all skin up. And I remember my mom was putting something on me, alcohol or iodine or methylate or something that burned like hell. And I remember her saying, in life, things hurt. And you're probably going to fall down a lot and you're going to get hurt. And I remember looking at her thinking, can't you do something about this? She said, this is what happens when you play outside. Sometimes you fall down and get hurt. And it seems like a really simple thing, but it's like, that's just a part of, that's it. So if I tell you next week, an 11th company is wanting to interview, I'm like, all right, buddy, when, when it finally does come in, it's going to be a hit. It's going to be like in the top 10. Let's all stand. I love everybody here. I forgive everybody here. If you're mad at me for something, you better let it go because <laughs> I ain't mad at you. If you don't love me, you better work it out because I love you. And if you say, but Bishop, we just need to talk about it. No, we don't. I don't know. If I went for the rest of my life not having to talk something out with somebody, I'd be fine. Here's talking it out for me now. You good? I'm good. You good? I'm good with you. You good with me? We good. Let's go. Let's go get something. <laughs> Let's go order something. I'm open for suggestions. <laughs> but I'm saying that the, the idea of just talking it out and, you know, yeah, I've, I've blown it. Because if you just showed so much anger that day, yeah, you pissed me off. I, I'm sure I, I'm sure I did. You've made me mad a few times. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's some. Oh, really? Y'all are upset at the p word? It's in the Bible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the b i b l e. Um, I have loved this series. I'm not sure what we're going to be talking about next month, but uh, I will know by next week. Look at the person next to you and say, you're good with me. And I better be good with you. Because we're all good with God.
tell the person next to you, I forgive you. Even if you don't, he said, well, they didn't do anything to me. Just go ahead and tell them anyway. Because it, tell the person next to you, I think you're awesome. Just like you are. You don't even have to change for me. You're just adorable. Say it. Please remain standing. Let me run this. Please. We're also getting a new one of these, but in the meantime. You can say it with Contributing it. at Metron is quick and easy. Simply text the amount you'd like to contribute to 404-620-5044. Once you've sent the amount you'd like to give, you will receive a link. Clicking the link will take you to a one-time registration form. This will make the contribution process even that? easier in the future. Once you've filled out the information form, you will then see a successful registration and donation page. You can now give any time by simply texting an amount to this number. To set up recurring contributions, log on to visionthenow.com and click Simple Give. We have more information on how to do this available for you in the back of the room. Thank you for your investment in Metron. If you have a check, just make it JESM and Danny will be back there to receive that. By the way, we had an excellent, um, I think you saw the pictures, but we had an excellent JESM board meeting last week and uh, you have wonderful leadership and I want to thank all the people who uh, met with us. But uh, it was very, and I don't enjoy board meetings, but that was a good one. And uh, so we're blessed. Uh, Metron is blessed. You're going to have a, a great day, a beautiful evening, a productive week. You're smart. You're attractive. You're blessed. You're successful. You're intelligent. You're prosperous. It's well with your spirit, your soul, and your body. You're healthy. You're vital. Your youth is renewed like the eagles. You're strong. You're hopeful. You're positive. Um, you have energy. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you and quickens your mortal body. The Zoe life of God. And you wake up tomorrow saying, this is the day the Lord has enabled me to make. I will be rejoice and be glad in it. Love you so much. God bless you. Go in peace.